Okay, in this part of uh, the video related to chapter 4, I'm going to discuss the concept of forward rates and we will see some applications based on the idea of uh, behind forward rates and we will see how we will calculate them and finally we will end with a discussion of an over-the-counter derivative called forward rate agreements which are based on the idea of forward rates so to start uh, let's ask ourselves what is the forward what do we mean by a forward rate well a forward rate is the future zero rate that is implied by today's term structure of interest rates so let's assume that we observe this uh, today so assume that we observe in the market uh, the following the one year zero rate is four percent and let's assume for simplicity it's uh, compounded annually and the two year zero rate also compounded annually is five percent so if we invested one hundred dollars one year we will get after one year one hundred and four and if we invested 100 at 5%, we will get after two years 110.25. Now, what is the rate that I need to invest the 104 that I will receive after one year to get a similar future value of my investment in the other zero rate? which is 110.25 so the forward rate tells me what is the rate that makes investing in the one year forward rate at 4% and then investing at the forward rate the, the, the future value of my initial investment will give me the same future value for investing 100 at the 5% for two years So the relationship between these different rates should satisfy the following relationship. 1 plus R from, uh, we, here we use a, a slightly different notation than what's in the book uh, to make it easy to track the different rates. Uh, uh, 1 plus R from 0 until 1 year times 1 plus R from year one until year two is equal to one plus r from today until after two years squared and why did we square here because this rate is going to be compounded twice in one year uh, in two years why we assume that the rate is compounded annually so that's why we use this uh, relationship to uh, describe the relationship, the, the uh, uh, how to get the forward rate when we are dealing with discreetly compounding rates. So we earn after one year one plus r times zero point one, so that's the future value, and we should earn the implied forward rate that starts from one year from now until two years to get the same value of investing uh, um, uh, the same amount at the two year zero rate very important uh, note that we have to pay attention to all rates here must be expressed using the same expression so if we are or stated using the same expression so if these rates are effective rates then we have to make sure that all these rates are effective rates otherwise these should be a nominal rates in which then we have to divide 
by M. And the implied uh, forward rate that we will get will be an APR also, not an effective rate. That's number one. Number two, we have to make sure that the period in which we are dealing with, okay, um, uh, it, the, the rates here, it, it type or um, state how many times this rate is compounded in, in, in a certain period. So in our earlier example, the first rate, the first rate times zero to one, from year zero to one, from, uh, from now until year one, is compounded only once. Why? Because <clears throat> we assume that the rate is, semi -an it is, is annually compounded. Now, if the rate is semi-annually compounded, <clears throat> then we should take into account that in one year, a semi-annual rate is compounded twice. And this also implies that in one year, the forward rate should be compounded twice. And it's all, if all, all the second rate is annually compounded and we are dealing with two years, then this rate is going to be compounded in a period of two years. Okay. We will also try to discuss this more in the, uh, in the class, but that's, uh, these, uh, these are the major issues you have to keep an eye on. Now, there is an important rule that we always have to keep in mind when we are dealing with uh, interest rates. What determines the frequency of compounding that is appropriate for us to use is that we need to know why we are using this rate. If we are using this rate to calculate payments, then the frequency of compounding must match the frequency of payments. If we are using these rates for discounting or compounding, purely for discounting or compounding, then any rate will uh, serve the purpose because it's a mechanical process. So if we discount using uh, a continual rate, or we discount using a continuously compounded rate that is equivalent to the semi-annual rate, of course using the different formula for that it should lead us to the same number so when you're purely discounting and compounding the issue is mechanical so we don't have to really convert unless uh, uh, it is uh, we are dealing with actual payments now there is another formula to determine the forward rate which is based on, uh, which is only appropriate when we are dealing with continuously compounded rates. So if we want to find the forward rate that starts from T1 until time T2, uh, and, and the rates we are dealing with are continuously compounded, then we need to uh, use the following formula, which is R2 uh, times T2 minus R1 times T1 divided by T2 minus T1. So assume that we have um, the following rates. We have a 3% uh, that's uh, for a maturity of one year, uh, and the rates are zero rates compounded semi-annually, uh, co continuously compounded. Uh, the rate with maturity of two years is 4%. The rate with maturity of three years is 4.6. And, and so on. Let's assume we want to find the three to four year rate, or in other words, we want to find R in which uh, we start from year three until year four. That is implied from the zero rates that we observe here. So how can we do this? Well, applying the formula, R T2 for us is 5%, 4, because T2 is 4, minus 
times 3 divided by 4 minus 3 4 minus 3 and this will give us 6.2 as we see in the table here Uh, alternatively, let's say we want to find the three, the forward rate that starts from year three until year five. In other words, I need the R that starts from year three until year five. So T1 is three, T2 is five. <coughs> so applying the formula, we will get <coughs> uh, 5.5. .5. Times five minus four point six times three divided by five minus three. So that will give us so that will give us six point eight five percent. Now, one small digression, which is uh, based also on the idea of forward rates, is the instantaneous forward rate. And this is a, a, theoretic, uh, a theoretically used rate to get the uh, forward rate uh, that is uh, applied for a very short period of time starting at, year t, uh, at time t. And this is usually used for uh, in theoretical uh, uh, derivations of uh, asset pricings and so on so I just want you to know about the instantaneous uh, forward rate <clears throat> now there is a relationship between forward rates and zero rates and par yields and this depends on what is the uh, structure or or how the yield curve looks like if the yield curve or the term structure of, of rates are upward sloping, then we should expect that the forward rates will be higher than the rates, which in turn will be higher than the par yield. So, and this graph here illustrates this idea. However, if rates are downward sloping, then this implies that uh, or we should observe that the par yield is higher than the zero rate which is higher than the forward rates an important implication of the idea of forward rates is that borrowers or investors can lock in a borrowing rate by taking two different positions in the current zero rates. Let's see how this looks like. Let's assume that Sabic wants to borrow cash to uh, finance uh, a project that it plans to start after two years. And it believes that it can pay back the loan uh, two years after it borrows uh, the funds so after four years from now and Sabic is concerned that interest rates in the future might increase so it wants to apply the idea behind forward rates to lock in a borrowing rate what could they do today uh, assuming that Sabic observes the rates we, we see in the table here and it can borrow and lend based on these rates so when a company borrows cash it receives cash okay at the time it borrows 
and then it will pay cash when it pay back the loan I want to apply this idea okay uh, to take a position in the zero rates that I observe in the market without paying any cash from my pocket and to uh, and to have the following directions of cash flows to meet Sabik's need so what could Sabik do well let's say it can borrow One hundred using the zero rate that matures after four years. So, looking back at the table, Savic can borrow one hundred at five percent for four years. So what Sabic will do with the 100 it borrowed, it will invest this 100 at 4% for two years using the zero rate that we observe in the table and matures after two years. So in effect, did any cash enter into the company's accounts today? Well, look again, it borrowed 100 at 5% for four years so it will pay back this amount after four years and it took this amount and it invested in the zero rate that pays four percent and matures after two years so nothing entered into the company's accounts it took one cash from one one side it it used it to invest in another side and Sabic will wait until after two years in which it will receive so after two years Sabic will receive 108.3287 now it will use this amount to finance its project after two years and after four years from now Sabic has to pay back the loan it borrowed initially at 5% for four years so after four years Savic will pay back 122.1403 so it is as if Savic borrowed after two years from now 108.32 and it paid back 122.14 by doing this Sabic was able to lock in a borrowing rate of six percent continuously compounded per annum so Sabic locked A rate of six percent continuously compounded how did we know that is six percent continuously compounded well there are two ways <clears throat> either we use the future value present value formula or we use the forward rate formula to calculate what is the two uh, what is the forward rate from year two so what is r from two to four which is in our case five percent times four minus uh, four percent times two is equal divide by four minus two and this will give us six percent 
Alternatively, we will use future uh, R is equal to len of future value divided by present value divided by T which in our case is len of 122 point one four o three divide by a hundred and eight point three two eight seven divide by two will also give me six percent so this example shows us that we can lock in a borrowing rate that we will incur in the future not today in the future uh, using the concept of uh, forward rates what's important to be able to do this is that we can borrow and lend at this rate we observe in the market if that's not the case i can borrow but i cannot lend or the opposite then uh, we cannot apply or we cannot lock in the borrowing grade as we have seen in this example. Yeah. Is that the only application we can do um, using forward rates? Well, the answer is no. We can also lock in an investment rate uh, in the future. So let's see how this works. Let's assume that there is a fund manager who knows that he will receive a certain amount of cash after one year. And he wants to invest it or lock in an investment rate for that amount that he's going to receive, applying the concept of forward rates. Uh, he wants to invest this fund or, uh, that he will receive after one year for a period of for a period of two years so the uh her investment horizon is two years which means it will start at year one and it will end at year three so what should he do today applying the idea behind forward rates so um uh let's just do um, a, a small adjustment let's uh, forget about this 100 he want to invest a certain amount of funds after one year for a period of two years so from which means he will receive back the amount of his investment three years from now so what should he do to lock in the investment rate well today he will borrow uh, will borrow 100 at three percent for one year and he will use this 100 to invest it at the 4.8% for, uh, for two years, uh, sorry, for three years. So what will happen? After one year, he has to pay back an amount of cash. So there will be a cash outflow uh, at the beginning of year one. And then there will be a cash inflow at the end of year three. And the direction of cash flows in any investment is that at the time you invest, you pay cash. And at the time you realize your investment, you receive cash. So we achieve this by borrowing at the shorter zero rate and investing at the longer zero rate. So after one year, the fund manager will pay back 103.045 so in effect the the fund manager had invested after one year 103.045 and uh, and after three years he will receive 
114.798. So in effect, the fund manager locked in an investment rate of 0.054% continuously compounded. And we can get this number either by calculating the return, the continuously compounded return using the formula uh, we, we saw earlier, or calculating the forward rate, which will lead to the same uh, with us to the same uh, uh, investment rate. Now, next we will turn to another important application of forward rates, uh, which is uh, a derivative called forward rate agreement. Now, forward rate agreements are OTC derivatives in which a certain rate will apply to a certain principle um, during a certain future period in exchange for receiving uh, for in, uh, for in, uh, in exchange for receiving um, a variable rate so the FRAs enable investors to lock in an interest rate for borrowing or lending over a certain period in the future what does uh, what do you mean by this um, here this is the timeline and this is the starting period, this is the ending period, and time zero. So a forward rate agreement it allows borrowers or lenders to lock in a certain rate in exchange for a variable rate. Uh, so, and this rate will start, let's say, from period T1 until period, and last until period T2. Let's agree on some notation before we uh, continue. So the major elements of an FRA uh, is that uh, we need to determine the notional amount or principal, which is L. Because when we are dealing with interest rates and there are payments that will take place, by just looking at the interest rates alone, you cannot calculate payments. You need a notional amount or a principal to multiply rate by this notional amount to calculate actual payment. T1 to T2 is the FRA period and RA is the fixed rate and RM is the reference variable rate and usually the reference variable rate is the LIBOR uh, is the three months LIBOR now it could be different so uh, uh, we pay attention to what is which LIBOR is used and finally usually FRA are quoted based on uh, T1 and T2 expressed in terms of months so we can say for example a 6 by 9 FRA it means that uh, a forward rate agreement that starts from uh, 6 months from now and lasts for 9 months so we, we need to keep in mind that there are no exchange of the notional principle um, in an FRA. Only exchange of payments with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the differences in the interest rates. To understand the dynamics of the forward rate agreement, there are two parties, uh, like in other derivatives, uh, there is a long party and there is a short party. The long position in an FRA is similar to a commitment to borrow from the short position an amount, the amount L at the fixed rate RK. And the short party, uh, and for the short position in an FRA, it is similar to a commitment to borrow from the long uh, party the amount L at the reference rate RM. 
So to give you a visual uh, description of the uh, FRA agreement, let's look at the following chart. So here, these are the two parties of an FRA agreement. Uh, <clears throat> the notional principle is always going to be L for both the long and the short. The long will borrow from the short the amount L and pay the fixed rate RK. And the short will borrow from the long the amount L and pay <coughs> the reference rate RM. <coughs> so you can see that what will happen in fact is, is there will be no exchange of L because the long will borrow from the short L and the short will borrow from the long L and both uh, uh, so uh, there will be no exchange of the principal. So what will happen is only there will be <coughs> an exchange of the differences in the interest rate. So if the interest rate for the long uh, or the interest rate that the long pays is higher than the interest rate that he will receive from the short, then the net effect is will be a payment from the long to the short. <coughs> and if the reference rate is higher than the, the the fixed rate then the net effect is that the short will pay to the long the difference between these two rates so at time t1 the uncertainty about the fria payment or pay payoff is resolved uh, illustrate the timeline of the event now this is uh, time zero so this is time zero. and this is time t1 in which the lending agreement will start and time t2 in which the lending agreement is going to end so today at time zero we don't know what will be the reference rate rm we know what is the variable rate rk but we have no clue what is the reference rate what will be the reference rate at that time so we have to wait both parties have to wait until we reach time t1 if we reach time t1 then the uncertainty about the reference rate is going to be resolved we already, already we will see in the market what will be the reference rate for example the libor what will be the libor rate today and if the LIBOR rate is higher than RK, then the short will pay to the long. If the LIBOR rate is lower than the fixed rate, then the long will pay to the short. So the long party will make a payment or receive a payment based on the sign of RM minus RK. If it is positive, then uh, then he's going to uh, uh, receive. If it is negative, then he is going to pay. Remember, he receives the variable and pays the fixed. So if the difference is positive, then he will receive a payment. If it is negative, then he will make a payment. Now, the interest payment or the settlement of the FRA could be made at two dates. Either the payment will take place at time T2 or the payment will take place at time T1. Now when you borrow money from the bank, for example, when you will pay interest, at the time you sign the lending agreement, which is similar to T time, uh, time T1, or when the first interest payment due which is at time t2 we will see if it is result if the if the uh, payments are made in time t1 what will, how much uh, the party will, will pay and if it is at time t2 how much the payment will will be so the the two parties the long and the short could agree that the payments interest payment take place or the settlement of the fra will take place either at time t1 or at time t2 
Now, if the settlement is at time t2, which means then the interest received or paid by the loan is determined by the notional amount times the difference between r and r k times the difference between time t2 and time t1. So, for example, if it's uh, three months and t is expressed in terms of years then uh, it go, it's going to be 0 0.25. Now, this case, when the settlement is at time T1, is known as that settlement in arrears. If the settlement is at time T1, then the interest received or paid by the loan is determined by, well, you look here, it's almost the same. L times the difference between Rm minus Rk times the difference between time T2 and time T1. What's, ad what's added here is that we discount this payoff by 1 plus Rm. So we are getting the value at time T1. So we are getting its value here at time T1. Uh, to, uh, to make the investor indifferent between receiving the cash at time T2, T2 receiving the cash at time T1 and investing the reference rate until time T2, he will receive the same amount. So if settlement is at time T2, the settlement is called set, uh, settlement in arrears. And if the settlement is at time T1, then it's called the settlement at the time of the borrowing. Let's take an example. Suppose today is March 1st, and an investor enters into a long FRA where the floating rate RM is the three-month LIBOR, and the principal is $5 million. And the fixed rate is, uh, which is RK, is 5% compounded quarterly. So we have to keep this important piece of information in mind. The FRA is designed to begin four months from now and end seven months from today. So in effect, the LIBOR, or sorry, the contract here, or the, the uh, the FRA is a three, uh, no, no, four by seven FRA. From because it starts four months from now and lasts se until seven months from now, so for a period of three months only. Now, assume that we reach July 1st and we observe in the market that the three month LIBOR is 5.4. Will the loan pay or receive? Well, to answer this question, we have to look at the difference between the floating, the fixed rate and the, and the variable rate. We saw that the payment for the loan is, is RM minus RK. So if difference is positive then he will receive if it's negative then he will pay. so if we uh, look at what these will what's the difference between rm and rk 5.4 minus 5 is equal to 0 0.4 so yes he will receive okay now the next question ask about how much will be the payment if the air uh, if the fra is settled in arrears well if the settlement is in arrears then uh, we multiply the notion 5 million times rm which is 0 0.054 Minus zero point zero five, and since 
these two rates are compounded quarterly and the difference between each payment uh, uh, sorry the difference between time t1 and time t2 is one quarter uh, and the frequency of compounding must match the frequency of payments we have to multiply these two rates by one over four or a quarter so this will give us 5,000 so the payment will be 5,000 and it's going to be due at time t2 because settlement is at arrears settlements in arrears sorry so the sh short will pay to the long 5,000 at time t2 How much will be the payment if the FRA is settled at the time of the borrowing? Well, uh, same process. The only difference is that we are going to discount. So this case number one, case number two. We are going to discount this 5,000 using the variable rate. Divide by one plus remember these states are APR so I cannot use them directly I have to convert them into an effective quarterly rate so to convert them into an effectively quarterly rate we divide by 4 so we divide by M the frequency of compounding and this will give us four thousand nine hundred and thirty three point four now the long should be indifferent between receiving five thousand and four thousand nine hundred and thirty three point four because if he received it at that at time t1 which is at which uh, which is the case uh, um, where uh, settlement is at the time of borrowing uh, he can invest this uh, uh, using the LIBOR rate rate for three months which will uh, uh, which will grow 5,000 at time t2 hence uh, the investor should be in between receiving the settlements in arrears or, or the FRA being settled at the time of borrowing now we conclude our discussion of the FRA by looking how we can value an FRA now the only unknown in an FRA is the variable rate let me ask this question today you know what is cyber rate so we can determine uh, what will be the interest that is based on today's cyber rate however do we know what is the cyber rate three months from now and remember I'm not asking about what is the cyber rate that we observe today that will mature in three months no I'm asking what will be the cyber rate that matures for let's say one month but three months from now can anyone uh, tell with certainty what will be the cyber rate three months from now no can someone tell tell us what will be the one the three months the cyber late one month from now also no can someone tell me f f with 100 percent certainty what will be the cyber rate tomorrow still no because we don't know what will be the the, the cyber rate and and it, it is possible that events could uh, happen which cause the cyber rate to move drastically so even if you can tell it's still going to be an expectation but you cannot tell for sure fine now let's go back to our uh, 
so here we are at March and July. Now let's say in June, I wanted to know the value of my forward rate. To be able to, to determine the value, I need to estimate the payoff. And to be able to estimate the payoff, I need what will be the, uh, that's the variable rate. And do I know uh, at the beginning of June, what will be the reference rate at the beginning of July? The answer is no. So how can we overcome this problem? Again, any process of payment, uh, any process of evaluation involves forecasting the future cash flows, then discounting it uh, using the risk fee rate if we are dealing with derivatives or an appropriate rate if we are dealing with something other than derivatives. And then we sum up the present value, and that will be the value of the thing we are trying to um, evaluate. So for us to value an FRA, we need to know what will be the, refer the variable rate, the reference rate, the LIBOR in our case. What will be the LIBOR one month from now? Uh, of course, we cannot uh, tell what will be the LIBOR rate with 100% certainty, but we can estimate it. And our estimation is uh, is good to uh, uh, a large degree, to a large extent, uh, if the market conditions did not change drastically, which is still a possibility. So the best way to evaluate an FRA or to value, define the value of the FRA contract is to estimate what will be the reference rate in beginning of July. But to do this, what do I need? Now we turn to the forward rate, the concept of a forward rate. We need to estimate what will be the forward rate. So I need at least the one month, uh, one month LIBOR reference rate, and I need the four months LIBOR rate. If I have these two, I can estimate what will be the three months uh, LIBOR rate starting one month from now. Okay, let's take an example. Now, here we have an FRA that was entered into some time ago by a company uh, in which the company will receive the fixed rate, 4%, which is semi-annually compounded, uh, and receive the, the uh, so and, and sorry, pay the, the reference rate or the variable rate which means the company took a short in, this, in the FRA or a long. Since the company is receiving the fix, then it's the short uh, party. What do we have? Let's look at the timeline first before we proceed with calculations. Now, the, according to the FRA, the lending agreement or the, the FRA will resolve one year from now. So time T1 is one, one year from now. And it will resolve, oh, and the, the lending agreement will end at time T2, which is 1.5. Again, do we know today what is the reference rate, what is the LIBOR rate at time T1, one year from now? And the answer is no. Okay, what should we do? We need to estimate what will be the LIBOR rate one year from now. And to do this, we need at least the, uh, the one year 
LIBOR rate and the 1.5 year LIBOR rate. Assume that we already, uh, according to the question here, we already did the estimation of the forward LIBOR and it's 5%. So the company will pay or receive an amount based on 100,000 times uh, the company will receive 0 0.04 and it will pay the reference rate which we estimate by using the forward LIBOR minus 0 0.05 times 0 0.5 why times 0 0.5 it's because remember the rates are semi-annually compounded and when you see rates that are semi-annually compounded you recognize that the 4 and the 5 are not effective rates. They are APRs or they are quoted rates or they are nominal rates, which is a rate that we cannot use directly to calculate interest payments or even to discount or compound. We need to convert them into effective rates to be able to calculate actual payments. So doing this, we will get uh, that the payoff out of the FRA will be a negative 500,000. Now this 500,000 will fall at what point in time in the timeline? Is it going to be here? Is it going to be here or here? Well, since the, the way we calculated the FRA, which, is, which looks like settle, uh, the, the, the FRA is settled in arrears, then the payment will take place at time t2 so this 500 is at time t2 and whenever i'm doing a, an evaluation of a project or an asset or a security or whatever we need to discount the value of the payoff or the cash flow to today's value so we need to discount until today how we can do this well we need to use the risk-free rate uh, that is uh, available when in, in our example assume that we have the OIS the 1.5 OIS with uh, uh, with continuous compounding equals to 4.5 so we have to multiply the 500,000 by the discount factor using E times minus 0 0.045 times 1.5 and we will get that the value of the FRA in millions is zero, minus 0 0.467 now assume if the six months LIBOR Ray, uh, LIBOR interest rate in one year turned out to be 5.5 so we waited for one, uh, uh, for one year and we found that the uh, the LIBOR the six months LIBOR instead of as we estimated to be 5% we found it equals to 5.5% with semi-annual compounding then the payoff the company will pay after uh, six months from the time the uh, uncertainty is resolved or at, after t, uh, time t1 is the notion or principle times the uh, uh, fixed rate minus the reference or the variable rate times uh, adjustments for the fact that we are semi and the rates are semi annually compounded and we will find that the company will pay at time t2 minus 0 0.75 million Now, it is possible that the settlement will be at the time of borrowing, which is time T1. So if that's the case, we discount this. We discount minus 0 0.75 divided by 1 plus 0 0.05. 
five five divided by two that will give us the value uh, the settlement will take of, of the settlement at time t1 this is equal to let's just calculate it so the settle the settlement at time t1 will be seven hundred twenty nine thousand and nine hundred twenty five Okay, that's it for the uh, our discussion of chapter four. Now there will be a small part related to duration and convexity. I will uh, dedicate a separate video for it in case if you want to uh, uh, learn about uh, these two uh, important measures in uh, fixed income uh, derivatives. Uh, I hope you find the lecture useful. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.